And for the first time in my life, I didn't feel all of those things I had always been ashamed of, but it wasn't because of the drugs. It was because I shared my truth and I was accepted and I wasn't alone. And it fueled like my passion to keep going. And um, I decided to start making videos just for fun. I literally had no frigging clue that any of this was going to happen. Never sure. in a million years. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 173. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I have a really cool interview for you. I have Tiffany Jenkins from Juggling the Jenkins. Uh, she probably doesn't require an introduction for a lot of you guys. Really popular blogger. She has a book. She's got an awesome YouTube channel and Facebook page where she talks about mental health life, addiction, all sorts of stuff like that. So really, really good interview. Before we get into that, I wanted to remind you that you can go to duffthepsych.com slash start here. If you want to learn more about me, perhaps you're a new listener to the show or you don't know who this guy is that's talking to you every week into your earbuds or whatever you're listening on, um, go to duffthepsych.com slash start here. And that has basically all my greatest hits, blog posts, podcast episodes, my TEDx talk, books, all that good stuff. And if you enjoy this show, please consider rating it on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, whatever they call it these days. Consider subscribing and consider sharing it with a friend because that really helps the show out. So with all that said, let's go ahead and get into this interview with Tiffany Jenkins. I think you'll like it. She said it basically felt like a free therapy session, which I take as a compliment. So please enjoy. Okay, friends, I'm excited to have a guest for you today. I have Tiffany Jenkins. Uh, Tiffany is a wife, mother, author, content creator and a recovering addict. She's the face behind Juggling the Jenkins and the author of High Achiever, The Incredible True Story of One Addict's Double Life. Uh, Tiffany, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Uh, I'll, I won't pretend like this isn't our second time doing this intro because of technical difficulties. <laughs> I was just second guessing my response. I was like, Does, did that sound real? <laughs> I know, right? Right. So what I was saying before we got interrupted, luckily it was at the beginning, is that um, I'm new to your stuff. I, I was suggested to have you as a guest by one of my listeners, looked into you and I'm like, oh, wow, this person is super popular and super cool. I watched one of your videos that was, you know, your, it was a skit if your brain could, could talk and you had the different elements of your personality, depression, insomnia, addiction, stuff like that. And the jokes oh, yeah. you used were just like, okay, this person gets it. So I'm really <laughs> excited to really excited to get into how you know you develop that sense and you know everything you've been through. Um, I don't know a lot about you personally, aside from the little bit that I've gleaned just from looking at your website. So it would be great if we could start off by you know maybe talking a little bit about what things were like for you growing up. Like, where are you from? What were your circumstances? Just kind of paint me a picture of that early stage. Sure. Um, I, my mother was a bartender and my father was a mover. He moved furniture. He had some problems, uh, with substance abuse when I was young. I didn't know it, but I found out later on, uh, my mom ended up divorcing him when I was seven and marrying a police officer who we then moved in with when I was around nine years old. And growing up, my sister and I were latchkey kids. Okay. So we were alone all the time and nobody was there to tell me when to eat, when to do my homework, anything like that. So I started gaining a bunch of weight and um, getting made fun of all the time. So I Where was this kind geographically? Of developed, uh, Sarasota, Florida. Okay. Okay. And what kind of place is that? Is that like a suburb or a big city? I'm not really familiar. 
Um, I'd say it's the big city. It's a place okay. where people go to retire generally. <laughs> so gotcha. nobody drives over five miles an hour. Okay. Okay. So please continue. Yeah. So I started um, kind of developing a sense of humor um, because I realized no boys wanted to date me. Nobody really wanted to be my friend. But when I started making people laugh and they gravitated towards me. So I started making fun of myself from a very young age. Um, as I got older, I realized there may have possibly been a little bit of neglect, not necessarily intentionally um, by my on my parents' part, but um, looking back, some stuff was weird. Like my friend's mom took me shopping for a new wardrobe and I thought it was because she liked me, mm. but I realized it's because I was wearing the same thing every day and she felt bad for me and things like that. Um, okay. Yeah. It, was that due to like the circumstances of, you know, money and things like that? Or did, do you see that as you were really, really kind of just on your own? I feel like I was just kind of on my own. Okay. Um, I I would be, my mom would let me go to my friend's house for like four days in a row and wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't need to check in or anything. And I thought it was because she trusted me. And maybe it was, maybe times were different back then, but like, I can't let my kids get further than a foot away from my ankles before I start freaking out, wondering sure. where they are. So, yeah. um, but both, um, my parents passed away. So I have all these questions and I can't get them answered. Okay. W when did that happen? Was that, was that as an adult or was that earlier on? As an adult. Okay. So looking back, you can't really, you, you have these unanswered questions that you can mull over, but there's no real way to get to what they would respond to. Right. And I'm not sure if, you know, the way I'm perceiving events is how it actually was, or if for some reason my brain is um, crossing things up, you know what sure. I mean? So sure. sure. what was your like relationship with them like at that time? Like aside from being a latchkey kid and kind of doing your own thing, did you guys get along pretty well or was there, was there turmoil within the family at that point? Um, my, uh, my mom and I went to counseling together when I was like 12 years old because I was just, I had a real attitude and I was really defiant. Um, I had, extreme anxiety and depression when I was little, but I didn't know like what it was. Nobody talked about it. I just thought I was crazy. Mm. Um, and so I think my mom really tried her best. Um, but she had my sister and I, when she was really young and so she was kind of growing up along with us. Trying to figure um, I didn't, it out. Yeah. I didn't see my dad very often. Um, sometimes we'd go over there on the weekends, but usually when we went over to my dad's, he would <laughs> take us, uh, right to a bar and we'd hang out at the bar while he drank with his okay. friends. Okay. So you had that exposure to that sort of, that sort of behavior that, from a very young age. Yeah. It's all I knew really was partying, people partying and drinking and stuff. Did you have any sense that there was something, uh, you know, abnormal or maybe not good about that at the time? Not at all. Okay. Okay. And, and drugs obviously come into play in your story as well, but I don't want to necessarily jump the gun to that point. Um, mm -hmm. How do we get from you being sort of a, a latchkey kid, developing a sense of humor, kind of uh, just doing it on your own to what inevitably came to be? Yeah. So things actually started getting better when I got into high school. Um, I was on the cheerleading squad. My mom and my stepdad were really proud of me. I had great grades. Um, I became popular because I was exercising. So for the first time in my life, I was moving my body around and I lost weight and I got tan and I got contact lenses and dyed my hair blonde and started hanging out with the football players and the cheerleaders. Um, but no matter how good looking I got on the outside, I still kind of felt like that weird, overweight, nerdy kid inside. I never felt like I fit in, mm -hmm. um, but nobody would have known because I was putting on a show constantly. So I had made it all the way through my senior year. Uh, I hadn't smoked a cigarette, skipped school, done anything. And one day after um, a basketball game in high school, somebody offered me a sip of alcohol, which had been done a hundred times before that. But for some reason on this night, I said, yes. Um, and I can't pinpoint why, but that sip of alcohol changed my life forever. 
Was that really, like the very first sip that you ever had? Like of, yep. ever? Okay. So very, very yeah. distinct. Like that was the time that you went from never having alcohol to have, having had it. Yes. And when I had it, it was like for the first time in my life, I didn't feel out of place. I didn't feel weird or awkward or I wasn't worrying about anything. I felt numb. And it was the numb feeling that I loved so much. I began chasing it. Mm -hmm. Cause you were anxious at that time too. It wasn't just like you didn't grow out of it as you got into high school. You still felt that, that sort of anxiety feeling often. Yes. But I didn't know what it was like. I, you know, most kids would be playing video games and their parents would leave the house and it would be that, but I would have to, you know, kiss my mom or dad or whoever I was with five times and tell them I loved you 10 times because all I could do was picture them getting into a car accident and dying and me never seeing them again. And, you know, uh, people would worry about, wouldn't worry about playing on the playground. And I would just be envisioning everybody's arms being broken and like these wow. really weirdo dark thoughts that weren't normal, but I didn't know how to talk about it. You didn't really have like a language for it at that time, but I, I'm sure you were exhausted from just sort of trying to keep the lid on, right? In hindsight, for sure. Yeah, but no, not really any insight into it. I, I, it sounds like you didn't really know what you were, I don't want to say what you were missing before you had alcohol, but sort of like the, you didn't know what the easy feeling felt like. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay, so, so you started chasing that after you were able to feel what it feels like to just not have those burdens for a minute. Yeah, and I ended up dropping out of school three months later. Was it just alcohol or did that progress? Alcohol progressed to marijuana. It never went above that though. But all of the people who were drinking and smoking weren't at school. They were already graduated. And so I, I wanted to be with them and I would try to go to school and try to pay attention. But I was like, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. I'd rather be anywhere else but here. And so I started skipping school and uh, my mom didn't know for a long time because I had the system down. They called if you miss second period so I made sure to make it to second period and then leave. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then eventually I just gave up and I ended up dropping out of school. And um, that was when I did around that time is when I discovered my drug of choice, which was opiates. Um, Let me ask when you were when you were kind of going through that period of, of sort of changing, you know, going from um, this 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 you know, a studious person, you know, uh, hanging out with people that you thought of as, as popular and all this sort of thing. And then uh, not being into school and going through this transition you talked about, did anybody notice that? Did, were, were people concerned? Did anybody say anything at that time? Well, I had distanced myself from the kids who were getting good grades and doing the right thing. I was kicked off the cheerleading squad because my GPA dropped. Mm. Um, and so I no longer talked to the cheerleaders or attended the events, you know, starting like the following month. And I, I really isolated and I hung out with one person, um, who was down to skip school with me. And I just kind of had uh, tunnel vision. I wasn't, I didn't really care. I wasn't paying attention. I can't remember anybody saying anything, but it might be because they never saw me, you know? Did you see those people differently at that point when you started kind of hanging out with this other crowd? Did you uh, like, yeah. did your opinion of those, the people that you used to hang out with change? Yeah. I thought that uh, they were boring and that they were missing out. They didn't know, you know, how fun it is to party. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So opiates, what are we talking about here? Uh, prescription pain medication. So I should say that prior to that, like, you know, when I turned 21 and I started drinking, um, I should have known then that I had a problem really because I was the girl who was like trying to fight people and trying to text everyone in her phone to invite them over to my house, okay. ripping my clothes off, waking up in ditches, just being obnoxious. Um, and I thought that was normal, but you know, it wasn't. And so in the midst of my drinking, I surrounded myself with people who were making not the best choices. And that's including uh, the person who offered me my drug of choice for the first time. And when, it, when I was offered uh, prescription medication, I had no idea about the side effects. Like we didn't have phones in our pockets back then. So I right. wasn't, so I wasn't privy to the information uh, like we all are now. And I, I always thought of drug addicts as like, 
old guys who lived under bridges and pushed shopping carts. And like, you know what I mean? That was the vision I had. I never thought it would be me. Mm-hmm. So I, it started off as fun for me. Um, another way to feel numb. And then it stopped being fun. <laughs> How so? There was a night where I was laying in bed and I was twisting and turning and in agony and I felt so sick and I called my best friend and I'm like, I don't know what's going on with me, ma'am, but I can't come out tonight. I don't feel good. And she said, have you had a pill today? And I said, no, not today. And she right. said, that's probably why. Take another one and you'll be fine. And so I called my person and I got one and I took it and instantly all of that pain and agony went away. And that was the night that I stopped doing the pills for fun and started doing them because I had to in order to not feel like I was dying. You were you were dependent on them at that point. Physically and probably a little mentally at that point. And but at this, yeah. this point in time, I mean, we weren't we weren't probably weren't talking about the opioid crisis as much at that point. Right. So like you, you may have not even had the knowledge of what your body was going through. Right. This was like 15 years ago, okay. um, 13 years ago. I have no clue how old I am or what year it even is, but yeah, <laughs> it was, it was a long time ago and um, I didn't, I, uh, it was new. It was when it, you know, it first started taking over these pills were selling for $15 a piece and then they started going up to 35 and then everybody, all my friends, everybody was like getting addicted to them. And I think like doctors started learning about it and they ended up limiting the amount of prescriptions that you could have. And so then it became like this cutthroat spending a ridiculous amount of money to get these things. And eventually what happened was they were hard to come by and another pill was on the rise and I don't know if any of your listeners are addicts. I don't really want to trigger anybody, but I'll say that um, once I had to start switching over to this other pill, the way that you administer it is different than taking it orally or snorting it. Okay. Um, you know, you you are welcome to, I will let people know ahead of time that, you know, what the subject matter okay. is, they can kind of come and go at their own discretion, you know, but to make it, to make it, you know, kind of grounded, you are welcome to say whatever the actual thing was or what you had to do. Okay, cool. So um, I should mention that um, when I was around 23 years old, my mother was diagnosed with cancer at age 46. Mm-hmm. And she ended up passing away five months later. And it was very sudden and hard to deal with. And I ended up checking myself into a rehab in 2009 because I thought that that's what I needed to do. I didn't want to, but I thought I was supposed to. Um, and I ended up relapsing on alcohol the night I got out. I was celebrating my commencement from rehab by partying. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're not alone in that. You're, you know, you're not alone in that. People have done that numerous times. Yeah. I didn't realize the problem was me. I thought the problem was the pills. So alcohol was okay in my eyes. And uh, it was a couple of months after that, I ended up meeting a deputy sheriff um, who was interested in dating me. And that's when things got real bad. Okay. T- take me down that road. Oh, that road. Um, <laughs> if, if you don't mind, you share what you want to share. Of course. No, I'll totally share it. Um, so I, I wasn't doing pills at the time. I thought I was okay. I met him at a bar. Maybe our second or third date, I confessed that I used to be a pill addict back in the day. And he said, that's not who you are. If that's not who you are anymore, then I have no problem continuing to date you. And I was like, this is incredible because I remembered how much stability my stepfather provided for my family. Hmm. And um, he was so different than the men I had been hanging around, you know, the drug addicts and the drinkers. And so I, I was really excited and I was like, this is exactly what I need not to relapse on pills. But (laughs) the problem is addiction doesn't care who you're dating. You know what I mean? And uh, about three months into our relationship, I ended up relapsing on pills. And I thought he would notice the minute he looked at my eyes, but he didn't. Mm. And, And that was when I realized like, holy cow, I could still have this fun on the side but keep up appearances. Like I've got my life together. You know what I mean? And so the best of both worlds. Exactly. So I ended up hiding my addiction from him for two and a half years. And during the course of the addiction, I began injecting pills um, into my system. Wow. 
so it, it, it not only did you relapse, you it intensified, right? Yeah, that was when um, the pills that I had been doing became harder to get. Yeah, and uh, people started switching over to this other pill. Um, for the record, it's Dilaudid, mm-hmm. um, and. I started injecting those and then I got addicted to the process of injecting as well. And, um, I would have to wear long sleeve sweaters all the time in the summer to try to hide this. And so every single word out of my mouth was a lie and an attempt to keep the truth about the monster that I was hidden. I didn't want to lose the house that he'd bought for us or the puppy that he'd bought for us or the love that he showed me. I was so terrified of him finding out that there was no limit to what I would do right. to stay high. Were you able and, to keep up appearances for, for quite a while and, and, and do the things that like you needed to do, you know, like kind of the minimums of, of quote real life along with this other life. Yeah. Two and a half years. Yeah. Yep. I had a job and I became like an expert manipulator and people ask me all the time, like, how did he not know he's a police officer? That's his job. And honestly, like he was such an incredible human being. He was so loving and so caring that I think that that part of him, you know, maybe knew something was askew, but was blinded by love. Or it was the fact that I had been high pretty much since the beginning of our relationship. So it's all he ever knew. Um, so that was just you to him. Yeah. And so I, it was every word out of my mouth was a lie. He paid for everything. He took care of everything and I took advantage of it and spent all my money on drugs and I was waitressing at the time. So it was easy to say, I didn't make any money tonight. Right. Just cash. Um, Yeah. And he, since he was a deputy, he would be on duty for 12 hours or so. And so I knew I had that window of time to get and use the drugs. Right. That's tough too, because for you, you know, you were sort of self-medicating and trying to, uh, you, you liked the person that you were when high in some cases, you know, except for like the extremes, but maybe you got to be more of a carefree, whatever person, you know, in your relationship because you were using these drugs, which is, that just sucks. That's it. It's so tempting. Yeah. I never really thought about it that way. Um, it also felt like I had dug myself this hole that was so deep Mm. and the only way to get out of it was to tell the truth, but to tell the truth would mean everything else around the top of the hole would come crumbling down and I would be all alone. So it was almost like I'd rather stay at the bottom of this hole and keep the walls up around me. Um, then tell my truth and risk losing everything. And, and the, the deeper I got, the, the more my desperation grew. And I began doing things for drugs that just, I never envisioned myself doing. I couldn't, I didn't know how to stop. I couldn't get off the carousel. It got to a point where like, when I say getting high, I don't mean like, oh, this is fun. I'm getting high. I mean, like, if I, I was doing the pills just to make it through the day. If I had to do a load of laundry, I needed a little bit of pill. If I had to leave the house, mm. I needed a pill. Conversation or family get togethers, I had to have a pill because if I didn't, it felt like a million invisible ants were biting my skin and my bones were twisting inside my body and the flu times 20. And right. Okay. You can only have the flu so many times before yeah. people are like, wait a minute. Okay. Then, then, then my, uh, my assumption was a little bit incorrect and I apologize for that, that you weren't necessarily, um, you know, getting to be a happy, more carefree version of yourself. You were just maintaining functionality by doing this at this point. Right. But also your observation wasn't that off because once you said it, I started thinking about it, like I was much more passionate when I was high. It was easier for me to express emotion and affection when I, you know, had something inside me because I've always struggled with expressing myself and feeling emotions and being affectionate. But when I was quote unquote high, it was a lot easier and I was in a much better mood. And so I was absolutely carefree um, during that time. And this, uh, the addiction kind of struck you during a really pivotal time in your like personal development too. So there's sort of a little bit of a chicken in the egg. It's like, did you not learn certain things because you were addicted? You know, it, it gets a little 100%. during that sort of period, I'm sure. 
Oh yeah. A hundred percent. And that's why, like, because my, and I say it all the time, but once I started using my brain was like a train that only had three stops and it was obtaining money, getting drugs, getting high. And then it would go back to the start. You know what I mean? Every day. And it never had time to steer off course and learn how to balance a checkbook or cook yeah. a chicken or anything like that. Cause I, I only had one focus in life. Right. And there was some, you, you mentioned that things started elevating and elevating, you know, I think uh, you tell me the number, but there was some, some legal trouble that you got into throughout this process. Right. I saw that on your website somewhere. Yes. Um, I w- ended up taking things from around the home. Um, and then I ended up taking some really important things, mm. um, of his, um, it, it's in the book and it's kind of like a surprise part, but it's also public knowledge. So I don't know. I took some guns, okay. um, and I sold them and I was eventually arrested from my home by people I knew whose weddings I had been to and baby showers I had been to over the course of the past few years. And I was charged with around 20 felonies. God, what was that like? Like, what was it like uh, having your friends show up at the door? Um, it, it was strange because they had been there to interview me the night before. And I was woken up out of bed by him, my boyfriend, who said, some detectives want to talk to you. And I'm like, I talked to them last night. Why are you waking me up early? I was frustrated. Okay. And I kept trying to put off talking to them because I was sick. I hadn't done a pill yet. and all of a sudden mid convert, he looked weird. And I was like, what is wrong with you? Why do you look like that? Why are you being weird? And suddenly one of the detectives busted into our bedroom and pointed at me and said, you out here now. And that was the minute I realized like, okay, this isn't a normal police questioning. Like something is wrong here. Did you, had you blamed like the loss of the guns on something else? Like you had gotten robbed or something like that? Initially, I said that um, I had this huge debt to pay back to a dangerous man, and um, I needed to get the money from the guns in order to pay this guy back because he said he was going to kill my family. Okay. Um, but the detectives saw through my bull crap, and sure, they said, "Listen, if you have a pro- the, in the interrogation room, they said if you have a problem, you need to tell us so we can get you help." And that was when I just gave up trying to lie anymore and decided to come forward with the entire truth. And then they tossed me in jail. <laughs> was your, your boyfriend at the time there for that, for when you sort of had this kind of come clean moment? Him and like seven other people were standing outside of the interrogation room watching the TV. I saw them every time one of the detectives walked in and out of the room. Right. Wow. And I, one time, man, the door opened and I saw his head was down and his hand was over his eyes and his friend was like patting his back and rocking him back and forth. And I was, it was bad. So was this, was, this was really sort of like one of those, your, your hand was forced, you know, you were, you had resolved to sort of keep digging that hole and building it up higher and higher and higher until something happened. And this is, this is what it came to. Absolutely. I knew something was going to happen and I had hoped it would be death to be honest with you. Wow. Um, And I, you know, what's so weird is I never in a million years thought that he would press charges on me. Like for some reason I thought when he found out he was going to be upset and break up with me and I could have dealt with that. Um, But the problem was, is when he called the police to investigate the burglary of the guns and they were researching, they found that him and I were the only ones who knew where the keys to the gun safe were hidden. And so Mm -hmm. they started looking me up in local pawn shops and they approached him and said, did you know your girlfriend was doing these things? And it took him completely by surprise and he was forced then to escort them to our home. Wow. So at that point, did you realize that, that you had an addiction or were you still, was it still the, the substance itself? Like, like where were you standing with regard to that, you know, at that point? Uh, Well, that's an interesting question because I knew like when I was using that, I was 
addicted to drugs, 100%. Okay. However, when I was in jail, I all I wanted to do was get out and drink a beer and a cigarette for the longest time. I'm like, I'll just drink beer and be a good person. I guess it still hadn't really hit me because I hadn't done any kind of program or anything to learn about addiction or myself. And it wasn't until um, he ended up, I spent 120 days in jail. Wow. And um, he ended up writing a letter to the judge and asking the judge to give me rehab. And the judge gave me a choice and I chose the rehab because I never wanted to go back to jail again. And in rehab, I learned like, listen, the problem is literally you, whether it's alcohol or pills or sex or food or shopping, you have the type of personality where it's never enough. And so once you realize that you could stay away from these things that send you into a spiral. And I started working on myself for the first time in life at rehab. I want to ask, do you feel like you would have been able to receive that message at any other point in time? Like, so if, if, if you had, you know, maybe gone to your rehab earlier before all this really, really took a turn and someone tried to give you that message, would you have heard them? <sighs> I honestly don't think so. And I hate saying that online because I don't want people to think that their only option is to go to jail or that it's impossible to stop on your own. I'm mm -hmm. so afraid of giving people that message. Right. You, um, that, that you would have to hit a rock bottom of some kind. I understand what you're yeah. saying. But I definitely think you have to get to a point where you realize nobody's coming to save you and it's up to you to save yourself where you get so sick of the lifestyle and the degradation and, you know, sleeping on the streets and stealing from people. It just gets to a point where you're like, enough is enough, man. Yeah. And that's when you become willing to hear the message. But had I not gotten caught, I honestly probably would have gone out fighting. Yeah. Cause it was working for you too. You know, I mean, that's the thing is it was, it, it, it wasn't the, best lifestyle, but it was, it was still working for you and you were still kind of building that, that fortress. So there right. wasn't a lot of reason for you to stop, you know, and, and that it kind of shows how powerful addiction can be, you know, that it takes something like that to overcome the pure desire to get the substance itself. It's, it's really powerful. Absolutely. I try to talk about enabling as much as I can online because if you love somebody man you're not prepared to make them sleep on the streets or starve or anything like that and sadly like in order for the person to realize no one's gonna save them they have to experience those things and it's so hard especially as a parent yeah um but that's what it took man now had he broken up with me and kicked me out and nobody would let me stay with them and i had to like sleep on the streets for, you know, a week or a month and I was out of money and I was dying and I was sick. Maybe, maybe I would have gotten help then, but I, you know, things happen differently for me. Yeah. You know, you brought up a question that I wanted to ask you, which is like, do you have any advice having been through what you've been through for families, you know, families who are on the sidelines of someone who's going through addiction, you know, like yeah. what, what can they do or how do you suggest they approach things when maybe the person isn't ready to change yet, you know, cause it can be hard to, you know, you kind of see this path in front of them so clearly, but they're not there yet. And so you're a little bit powerless. Sometimes that's a spark of anger in the other person. Like what, what kind of lessons have you gleaned about, you know, how families or loved ones can relate? Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that loving an addict is the hardest thing um, that most people will ever have to go through truly. Like you said, watching somebody that you love wither away to nothing and not being able to smack some sense into them. You know, you want to hug them, you want to shake them. It's friggin' heartbreaking. And I would suggest learning the difference between loving and enabling because there's a very fine line. And if you don't pay attention to that line, you could quote unquote, love your addict to death. And How do you so tell the difference. So for first of all, there's uh, a website that I always suggest. It's nar-anon.org. Naranon. Um, it's not sponsored or anything by me, but it's just a website. It's specifically for loved ones of addicts, and they have groups just like NA meetings, except it's family members of addicts who meet online and in real life. 
um, and share their experience, strength, and hope. And you gain insight from other parents who are going through something similar, who have had successes, you know, mistakes they made. It's so important to get involved with the community and find support because none of us are born knowing how to deal with an addict. Right. Um, and so until then, what I would say is if you are doing anything that allows your addict to continue living the addict lifestyle for a moment longer, it is enabling. And people get mad at me sometimes when I say this, but I'm going to be brutally honest in my opinion. Um, if you are giving an addict money, or rides, or buying them cigarettes, or paying for their phone plan, even giving them a safe place to sleep at night. That always ticks people off, but it's the truth, man. It took me being in suicide watch at the jail with nobody coming to visit, nobody putting money on my books, nobody sending letters to realize that's it. I've burned every bridge. I have nowhere to go. It is up to me. People are not going to bail me out this time. And so it's the same thing with families of addicts. If you run around chasing your addict with a pillow or a soft place to land before they hit their rock bottom, they never will. And um, it's so hard. It's so hard. But there's like a general saying that if an addict is happy with you, you're probably enabling. And if they're pissed off at you, you're probably trying to save their life. Yeah. There is nothing... So I was going to say, I'm sure you could have such empathy with the, with the family members though, because like yeah. to get to the point where you're willing to let your child sleep on the street or something like that, whatever that extreme is in this, in the same way that overcoming addiction takes a lot of some, some, some other motivator, you know, it's like, it takes a lot to get you to that point as a, as a parent too. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you get robbed so many times or you're heartbroken so many times, but it's a choice that you have to make. And people think, well, I'm never turning my back on them when they need me the most. Like you don't have to turn your back on them. It is possible to love them without giving them anything. You know what I mean? It's possible yeah. to let them know you care without bailing them out of situations. Um, there's a, there's a piece of advice that I often give people and I want to know if, if this sounds right to you, but I often tell people that communicating. So if they're on the parent side of this or the loved one side of this, communicating clearly and consistently, even if the person isn't ready to hear it yet, you know, saying, I love you. I'm not going to support you doing this, but I love you. Like, you know, being as clear as you possibly can, that that voice is, is still in there. And at some point, maybe the person might be willing to hear it or in retrospect, they'll know that it was there. Do you think that that's true? I do. I really do. I, um, there's nothing anybody could have said to me during my addiction that would have sparked a change. Words are not strong enough to spark a change, uh, right. in me at least. Sure. Um, there's, and so, you know, my family members felt guilty and I'm like, literally you could have chained me to a pole in your trunk of your car. And I would have chewed through the friggin' handcuffs to get to my drugs. Like, yeah. trust me. Yeah. And so it's, so important that, you know, the person knows that you love them. Like you said, they're going to tell you to F off. They're going to tell you they hate you and tell you you don't love them and that you don't care about them. They're going to say it because addicts are, well, me, I was incredibly defensive and angry all the time. And so they're going to say that, but they don't mean it. They're just desperate to the point where I would have chosen death over withdrawal any day. And if a person is walking around facing that choice on a daily basis, they're going to be a little sharp. And sure. so it is so important to let them know, I love you. I will always be here when you're ready to get help. Uh, you know, you can come over and watch TV with me. Sometimes not really, because if you let them in your house, they could steal. And I know right. that firsthand. Man. So you just got to be, no, you know, every addict's different. But we're also a lot alike. And so um, you have to protect yourself in these situations because you will end up drowning alongside of your addict if you don't protect yourself. It sounds like you're kind of saying it's, it's not on you, but you do need to recognize that you play a role. 100%. Yeah. I, I want to I get back to continuing your story because obviously you're not in this place anymore. You know, obviously something did change and you've been able to craft a different life for yourself. So what, what, 
how do we get from, you know, jail to where you are now? Um, well, I made the decision to go to rehab. I went to rehab for six months and this time I wanted it. I wasn't doing it because I thought it's what I was supposed to do. I wanted it. There were times I wanted to give up, but I luckily had a lot of really strong women around me who were there for me during those weak moments. And I learned to communicate those feelings to those women when I felt them instead of keeping it inside my head. Mm. Um, after six months of rehab, I made the decision to go to a halfway house because I was ready for freedom, but I knew I still needed accountability. And it was in the halfway house that I began learning those life skills I never got to learn when I was getting high. Um, and so I had chores, I had a job, I had to attend meetings. And uh, very shortly after moving into the halfway house, I ended up meeting a boy and getting pregnant. And by very shortly, I mean two months after meeting the boy, okay. I was pregnant. All right. So that's a change. <laughs> yeah, big time. Um, and then I was terrified and I was like, these are not ideal conditions for having a baby. I am in a halfway house. I have no job. I have no car. I have no belongings. I'm starting literally fresh. And I got one flipping overnight pass at this guy's house. But it kind of like motivated me and inspired me to work really hard. Um, and we ended up getting married at five months after knowing each other. And I, we busted our butts and moved in together. And I gave birth to my son on my birthday. And when my son was six months old, I found out I was pregnant again. <laughs> All right. And then when my daughter was born 16 months after my son, my husband's daughter from a previous relationship came to live with us when my youngest was two weeks old. So I was the married mom of three suddenly and trying to cope with life <laughs> and being sober and being a mom. And that was when I started writing and making videos and it took off. Did you have any further relapses during that point or was it basically an upward trajectory from there? Yep. Upward trajectory. I haven't used mm. since November 26, 2012. Beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you. Tell me about what you, like, how did you get the idea to start like documenting things or making content? Like, was that something that, were you already a fan of people who were doing that? Like, how did that even come into the realm of what you were thinking? No, actually, I, I don't know. I've always dreamed of being an actress and I've always been such a ham and I love being in front of the camera and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, but once I started to love myself again while sober, I started to appreciate myself and I tried exploring other things um, that made me happy because I was in fact depressed. I had postpartum depression after Chloe was born and I was mm. isolating. My husband was gone all the time. Um, and so writing became an outlet for me. And once I started sharing things that were really close to my heart, and people surprisingly stored it, stored it, <laughs> started, started. <laughs> surprisingly started uh, reaching out to me and thanking me for my honesty. I was like, holy cow, I'm not the only one who feels yeah. like this. And for the first time in my life, I didn't feel all of those things I had always been ashamed of, but it wasn't because of the drugs. It was because I shared my truth and I was accepted and I wasn't alone. And it fueled like my passion to keep going. And um, I decided to start making videos just for fun. I literally had no frigging clue that any of this was going to happen. Never sure. in a million years. Never, ever, It was really, ever. really genuine. You weren't trying to become an influencer or something like that. It just came from the heart. Yeah, absolutely. And I wouldn't even know how to influence anybody to do anything. <laughs> like I couldn't even get off the couch. So... Yeah, it's, it took me by surprise. It was incredibly overwhelming. News stations started reaching out to me. Suddenly, boom, millions of followers. And I like, I looked at my husband. I'm like, something is happening. Help me. I don't know what's going on. Well, over what so period grateful. of time was this growth happening? Like, what are we talking about here? Going from kind of, you know, starting to pick up a little bit of steam to, like you said, millions of followers. Uh, so my first video was posted two years and three months ago. Holy and cow. Um, within the first year, I forget how many months it was, maybe 10 months. I got a million followers three months later, another million, three months later, another million. And it's like up to 3.6 or something now. And I just, it was so overwhelming. And then it, suddenly there's like this weirdo pressure, you know what I mean? Like, oh my gosh, people are depending on me to make them laugh and inspire them and help them out of these ruts. 
And now it's like, okay, well, if I'm going to spend all my time doing this, I have to make money doing it. So now suddenly it's a business. Yeah, it's a job now. But I can't make it too businessy because then it'll turn people off and they'll think I'm a sellout. So I have to teeter totter this balance between, you know, remaining myself and doing the same thing I did when I first started and mm-hmm. somehow generating income for my family. And I honestly just, I Google all day, every day, like how to be a better person. How to <laughs> Work life how balance, how to do this, how to do that. Really, yeah, for real. If you look at my search history, it's a combination of serial killers and self-help. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, you are not alone. I mean, most of the audience <laughs> listening to this probably has the same search history. There's a lot of murderinos <laughs> in, the, in the audience, I'm sure. Oh, hopefully, because otherwise it took a dark turn here. But but yeah, and that's also how I started writing my book as well. I was releasing a chapter a week on the blog and people were so captivated and I was so surprised that people were like desperate for the next chapter. And somebody sent me an email and said, I wish I could send this to my son who's in jail. You know, it's so inspiring and it gives me the perspective of an addict, the way you write it, it's like, I'm going alongside of you during this journey. And so I was like, how can I make this happen? So I Googled Mm -hmm. how to write a book. Uh, And then I Googled how to self publish a book. And the old me would have been like, no, this is way too much work. I can't do this. But the new me was like, Hey, you're about to be an author girl. Buckle up. You got this. (laughs) That's great. And, And so I did, I wrote a book and I self published it at the end of 2017. And surprisingly it sold like 30,000 copies or something. And it was, yeah, you got a like insane number of like two, almost 2,500 reviews on the U S Amazon. They're like mostly all five stars. So people clearly are resonating with it. Yeah. I did not pay anybody to do that. I swear. I have no clue. how. <laughs> I um, believe, but, yeah. Yeah, but then, um, uh, penguin random house, um, reached out to me. And said, we'd love to republish your book under our house. What, what made you decide to actually do that? Because I've been approached that way too. And I haven't, you know, because having total control, the royalties, all that kind of stuff of self-publishing is so great. Uh, yeah. And it's kind of your baby too, especially yours, because that's your story. Like, how did you decide to actually let somebody kind of take that and run with it? Yeah. So the royalties of self-publishing are unparalleled. (laughs) It was really incredible. Uh, It was, you know, I was able to stop working and things like that, but man, like never, when I first started doing all this, I had 12,000 followers. I used to send, you know, parts of my book, my story to publishers all the time. And they said no left and right. And that was when I gave up and decided to self-publish and when I was approached, I was like, I don't know if I'll ever get an opportunity like this again. Like I got to do it. It was just one of those things where I wanted it to be in the hands of more people, not for vanity or ego reasons, but because of the feedback that I'd gotten on the self-published version. And I figured if it could be in airports, you know, or in the hands of somebody who wouldn't otherwise know about it and can help them understand their loved one, then I am all about it. Yeah. It was an easy decision. Good, good. And you deserve that notoriety too. I mean, you're not looking for it, but like, I think it's, there's something so beautiful about your story that the type of content that you make is like 100% you, right? It's your personality, it's your quirks, it's everything like that, which is sort of what you were trying to get away from and dumb down with the drug. So it's, there's something kind of beautiful and full circle about it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And honestly, it's all I know. Like I couldn't try to be anything else. Um, Like it wouldn't work. I just, I'm so weird and awkward and it's all I know. It's just, and people are digging it for the first time in my whole existence. And it's so rewarding. And so I'm just trying to share my truth and encourage others to let their weirdo side out as often as possible. The world would be so much cooler if people were just bumping into stuff and laughing obnoxiously, you know? Yeah. 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 If, if you, if anybody listening hasn't go to the the YouTube channel, look at the trailer that kind of says it all. You're in a world of influencers. There's you bum, bum, bumbling around and doing all that, which is, which is so great. I love it. Thank you. My husband did the intro voice to that. That's great. He did a good job. Give, give him my, give him my props. <laughs> what have you learned about like, so from not just the, the addiction part, but from this, you know, juggling the Jenkins, this, this whole thing we've just been talking about, what have you learned about 
like people, like humanity in general from this process? Mm, I've learned a few different things about people. Um, I have learned that there are people out there who are genuinely willing to love you despite your flaws and your lack of perfection. The people out there are yearning for a dose of something real on social media. Like there's this internet and it's taken over our life and we spend all of our time on it. And people just want so badly to relate, to see something that resembles them because all we do is compare. So I've learned um, the power of empathy, man. Like so many people, um, are loving and understanding and more than I realized. I thought the internet was full of trolls and haters and there are certainly those, but man, there are so many people out there who are able to open their hearts and look at things from a different perspective. And that was a gift to learn. Great. Uh, Yeah. I I think a lot of people can feel, you know, uh, the opposite, like we were talking about, you know, isolated on the internet and that it's full of all these bad things. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder, it, it, I've taken up a lot of your time, so I want to be respectful of that. Um, but if, if you had maybe like in a last word to say, speaking directly to people who are struggling or have struggled with addiction, right? So maybe specifically the person who is still struggling with, you know, maybe relapses, they feel like they've kind of blown the life they could have had. What would you want to say to them? I would want to say, um, I think back to the time in jail when I tried to end my life and I was so desperate to die and I thought I had no future. Um, I remember being so ready to go and being so angry when the corrections officer saved me. I couldn't understand it back then, Um, but I had no way of knowing back then, no way whatsoever of knowing just how amazing my life was about to get. And I could have sat around all day trying to envision my future and it never would have looked like it does now. I have my beautiful babies. I wake up every day clean and not leashed to a drug. And if today you feel like giving up and throwing in the towel, you have to know that reaching out for help and accepting the help is the greatest gift that you could give to you and future you. A life after addiction is possible. There's nothing special about me, nothing in my DNA that allowed me to overcome the drugs and live a great life other than willingness. And all of us have the ability to do that. And so I, if you are struggling, I am sending you love and I encourage you to reach out for help because it's available. Beautiful. I think that's a great place to leave it. Tiffany, thank you very much for coming on the show. Can you tell people if if they're unfamiliar, you know, where they can see your stuff, what you have going on right now, anything you want to plug or just direct them toward? Thank you so much. Um, I, I got the book situation. It's called High Achiever, The Incredible True Story of One Addict's Double Life. It's available uh, on Amazon and um, bookstores, some of them. Uh, also, uh, I'm just pretty much juggling the Jenkins everywhere. Facebook, mm-hmm. uh, my website, Instagram, all that stuff. Great. Well, thank you again for your time. And I, I really hope people go out and, and see all the stuff you're doing. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. 